I was a visiting scholar back in like 2011, so it's really nice uh, to be back here and to see like old faces and new faces. Um, so thank you for the invite. Um, so <clears throat> the study I will we'll present today uh, is a part of a larger project. So uh, I want to briefly introduce uh, the larger project, like a project data. Um, digital ad tracking and analysis. Um, so just a little bit of an overview, like uh, what motivated this research uh, project. Uh, for my uh, entire career, uh, almost, like I, I have been studying like, passionate people who care about a particular issue uh, almost exclusively. Uh, so I've been, I have been writing a book about these passionate individuals and the name that, like a conviction publics. And then conviction publics are the 21st century issue publics, like those who uh, consider like a particular issue personally important because of their value, identity, uh, or self-interest. Like for example, some people care about the abortion issue because of their religious value. Uh, some people care about racial issue because of their racial ethnic identity. Uh, gun owners care about gun rights because uh, the gun control issue will directly uh, will have a direct implications on in their uh, everyday life. Um, so uh, what I found that like, as a political communication scholar, I have been focusing on uh, their media and information consumption behavior and its influences on voter engagement, such as turnout and voting decision. Uh, what I found that um, these people uh, don't like mainstream news media. Uh, rather, they uh, like digital media outlets that specialize in the issue they care about. Um, and even though they have uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, find uh, some information on the wide range of issues, they tend to narrowly focus on the issue they care about. Um, so they are not a master of a politics, but uh, they are specialists. Uh, and then I thought that uh, the public uh, in the 21st century might uh, consist of this uh, large number of a small size of a conviction publics. Uh, now, uh, the big data revolution. Uh, so big data revolution brought, out, brought about like, you know, sea changes in the political communication landscape uh, that also uh, turned me to uh, another part of the equation. Uh, with the wide range of uh, prevalent like, data availability uh, and sophisticated data analyst techniques uh, and algorithm-based like, digital media platforms, um, uh, how groups of political campaigns, uh, non-party groups, uh, or even unknown actors try to target, identify, uh, and then even mobilize or demobilize like a conviction publics. Uh, that's my like a big question here. Uh, and then um, my answer, short like a gut feeling answer was like uh, targeted advertisement. Uh, so targeted uh, advertising is really important because you can narrowly target these people and then uh, send out like a persuasive messages or mobilizing messages or demobilizing messages. Uh, but then I ran into a big huddle, uh, which is uh, I, can't, I could not like, collect the data. Because unlike uh, TV advertising, digital advertising are designed to appear to uh, targeted individuals only. So that means digital advertising, uh, its advertisements are not publicly accessible. Um, so then uh, what do we need to do? Um, so what um, we decided to it, decided to do is that to take okay so then like a let's like a user based approach let's take a user's perspective so we develop a broader extension uh, that work on the user side uh, so this is very different than like a you know usual app or uh, scrapping like a website or uh, getting like a uh, you know API data uh, from particular platforms. Um, so this is this works like uh, work like uh, ad blocker, 
uh, but instead of blocking the ads, uh, it automatically detected uh, and then sent the ads to me. Um, so <clears throat> we collected like ads and then uh, meta information such as like a landing page information um, uh, across like a different uh, digital media platforms like a Google, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, and the like. So I'll give a little bit more information about like how we could use this uh, data collection tool. Uh, we went through the full board IRB review, and then uh, the project has been approved by the internal review board of the research for human subject protection privacy, uh, and then we followed the full uh, protocols. Uh, we did not collect any uh, personal data. Um, no profile data uh, is entirely anonymized, uh, and then no network data, nothing like that, just the ads. Um, okay, uh, because the ad collection tool was user-based, uh, it is really important to uh, evaluate how representative uh, the users were. Uh, so our recruitment strategy, uh, I work with the GFK, which is uh, uh, largest like a social science and marketing research firm uh, and uh, we our recruitment strategy is to meter uh, the US voting age population in terms of race income uh, state uh, education gender age and uh, whether they uh, registered to vote or not uh, and then we found that our sample generally meter uh, the US voting age population um, and also, uh, we statistically tested, I guess, you know, whether uh, e-scope our tool uh, adopters and non-adopters were different, and we didn't find any statistical differences in terms of this basic demographics. <clears throat> so in the end, uh, we collected 87 million ads exposed to about 17,000 uh, consented participants across multiple platforms. Uh, over 10,000 users completed our baseline survey, which includes some demographic information uh, and political profile information. Uh, among them, uh, 1,200 uh, people participated in our four wave panel survey. Um, so the data was collected for two weeks prior to uh, each of the state's primary elections. Um, and six weeks prior to uh, the general elections. So, so it is important to note that our data collection uh, period uh, all uh, fell under the Federal Election Commission's uh, reporting requirement window. So um, if there are any like, ad spending during this FEC window, you have to report your activities and disclose your activity uh, uh, to the FEC. Um, there are some, uh, and if you mention uh, candidate names uh, who are running for federal uh, races. Um, okay. Um, so the study uh, I'll talk about today uh, is uh, the stealth media, the groups and targets behind the divisive issue campaigns on Facebook. So this one just to focus on Facebook. Uh, again, I was interested in uh, Facebook because I was interested in, you know, conviction behavior, uh, public like behavior because the Facebook is a uh, really good place to form like a community or groups uh, or pages. Um, so um, I was interested in that. Obviously, I was interested in uh, well, which like a hot button, like a divisive issues. Um, and uh, we are trying to track uh, some groups, uh, like a nonprofit, like who did not report, uh, you know, FBC, but like are still doing some candidate advocacy ads and things like that. Uh, but we discovered a lot more uh, in the end. Um, and then uh, this this is uh, forthcoming in uh, an academic peer. Uh, peer-reviewed academic journal on political communication, and then to our best knowledge, this is the first large-scale systematic empirical analysis of groups and then targets uh, behind divisive issue campaigns. Uh, I personally spent a lot of time on this project uh, last year. Uh, we started a data analysis about this time around, like last year, uh, and I have been very busy since then. 
uh, and so did like a Facebook. So Facebook uh, in September uh, 2017, uh, Facebook finally admitted that uh, 3,000 ads linked to 470 uh, Facebook groups or pages were purchased by uh, internet research agency, a premium link to Russian uh, disinformation campaign operator. Um, so Facebook also noted that uh, the ads primarily focused on hot button social uh, political issues such as guns and LGBT rights and immigration and right, race uh, and then targeted a specific segment of the population. Uh, but that was not it. As you all know, like uh, six months later, Cambridge Analytica scandal like, uh, broke out. Uh, the whistleblowers indicated that Cambridge Analytica, a data analytics firm uh, uh, that was hired by dozens of uh, super PACs and uh, political campaigns, uh, including the Trump campaign, uh, harvested it up to 87 million uh, Facebook users' personal data to target like, a particular segment of the voters and ultimately to influence the election uh, outcomes. So despite the broad media coverage of this revelation, uh, I feel like we still know a uh, little about what exactly happened like, behind the scene of Facebook during the 2016 election. So we're still working on that. Like, and this is some of the preliminary, well, the first set of uh, findings. So why we didn't know uh, all of this like, until now, um, what does that mean? Uh, so it raises uh, like, pressing questions, uh, like just as like, a stealth bomb, uh, bomb or like, shoots at a target without being detected by radar. Do digital media platforms uh, function as a stealth media? Uh, so we define the stealth media as a system that enables the deliberate operations of a political campaigns with undisclosed sponsors or sources, uh, furtive messaging uh, of specific issues, and imperceptible targeting. Uh, so this is like a big question uh, for this study. Uh, more specifically, who were the groups uh, that ran political uh, divisive uh, issue campaigns on Facebook, and then who were the people targeted by uh, these groups? Okay. Um, so the so methodological approaches. Uh, so this study, uh, it's like a small set, a relatively small set of our data, uh, which just focused on uh, five million paid ads. Um, on Facebook uh, that are exposed to nearly 10,000 uh, consented participants uh, between September 28th to November 8th, 2016. So we just focused on like a general election. Uh, we focused on paid ads only because uh, it, it has like a paid advertising has a clear policy implication. Um, so for those who don't know much about like, paid ads, like, uh, there, Facebook actually uh, provides all types of promotional messages method, messaging methods, uh, but there are two uh, major placements. Uh, uh, one is a sponsored news feed. Uh, so this is like a sponsored news feed. Uh, so this just looks like a regular news feed. It's embedded in your news feed uh, with a little bit of like an indicator like a sponsored. So this is like a paid ad on a sponsored news feed. Um, on the other hand, there is all the ads on the right side, uh, right hand side, and then this this these ads are called like a right column ad. Uh, right column ads are more of like a banner ads, like it's a uh, generally short. Uh, even though like now this uh, this image is a replication of back in 2016 uh, when we collect the data. So like now right column ads size like a lot bigger uh, than before. Uh, but <clears throat> so this is how like a sponsored news feed and then right column ads um, look like. And then we uh, collected like both types of ads. Um, 
So uh, this research like, uh, consists of like, two separate studies. And then first uh, is about groups, like uh, who are behind the divisive issue uh, campaigns. How did we do that? So eScope uh, collected uh, the, all the ads and they extracted the texts uh, in real time and then also saved the image files. Um, we lost some of the image files um, because some images, like we just thought, like, well, we could replicate it later, so just to save the, um, to save our server <laughs> uh, load, like we just save the URL and then realize later, you know, those are gone. Um, but uh, we, the important meta information associated with this as like a landing page information. Uh, so what is landing page information? It's like landing pages. Uh, ultimate destination. So if you click on the ad where it uh, leads us to. Uh, some usually, generally, this is like a Facebook page. Like a Facebook page is uh, Facebook create face like a mini like a website to within like a Facebook, and then Facebook created this for brand promotion. So a lot of political organizations and groups and cause or communities like use as a Facebook pages. Like a defeat Hillary, for example, uh, has like a Facebook uh, page. Uh, this is what. Uh, the Nick's, uh, the Cambridge Analytica CEO, like uh, bragged about this is like a very successful, you know, brand of Cambridge Analytica. <clears throat> uh, but not always uh, the landing pages are linked to like a Facebook uh, pages uh, because we are able to collect the landing page information beyond the Facebook because we did not use Facebook API. Uh, so we are also able to uh, capture like a the external uh, landing pages as well. So this is uh, this ad is a right column ad, but it, uh, if we click it, then it goes to uh, outside of a Facebook, uh, which is just like a petition like a page uh, on the specific issue, like a move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem. Um, so it was just like a anatomy of like the political advertising on the Facebook. And the study one, uh, we looked at, uh, again, the groups behind the divisive issue campaigns. And then we quickly realized that after, you know, uh, just take a couple of trials, we quickly realized that we are dealing with a lot of unknown actors. I mean, I was shocked that we just ran like a you know, big data search and then only few uh, groups are actually registered with FBC. So like, at first I thought, like, well, you know, our data collection might have gone <laughs> wrong, uh, but we realized that uh, there are a lot, a lot of unknown actors. So we had no choice but to exam uh, the, all the ads organically, one by one. Uh, so, but like, we are resource poor, so what we did is we just randomly sampled like 50,000 ads first, uh, and then match it with uh, our keywords on like a um, we developed like a political advertising dictionary, uh, and then we focus on eight issues: uh, gun, <clears throat> abortion, gun, LGBT, nationalism, alt-right, terrorism, uh, race, uh, immigration, uh, and uh, candidate scandals like uh, access hold and then uh, Clinton email scandal. Uh, so we filtered uh, all these uh, ads. And then uh, identified like eight divisive issue domains, uh, um, and then we looked at uh, all the ads like one by one, and then track back their sponsors by uh, tracking like a landing page information. Um, and then uh, we classified the groups uh, into multiple categories. Uh, first, uh, if a group is found in the uh, Federal Election Commission data, meaning that like, this group uh, filed a report to FEC, uh, then we call them FEC group. Uh, so, but if it's not there, we move to IRS uh, data. So all the nonprofits would have like, IRS. This is tax information, uh, so like a business tax file. So we look at uh, whether they're registered as like, a nonprofit. Uh, 501c3, 501c3, uh, that's like a not advocacy group, and then C4, like a social welfare group, and things like that. Um, and then if it's still not there, then we move to uh, um, 
other like we use like other research databases such as news archives, uh, media watchdog, uh, or uh, just the research archives that whether this group is ever mentioned by uh, someone else other than themselves. Um, and then uh, we looked at their about like mission pages, and then these groups are mostly we call them like an astroturf uh, movement. Uh, unregistered uh, organizations. If we still found nothing, uh, then they remain like a suspicious. So suspicious groups are uh, basically uh, unidentifiable, untraceable uh, groups that do not have any public footprint. Uh, and, um, and then we just, just set them aside. And we didn't know what to do with this, but it's, it was actually a lot. Uh, and then uh, you know, note that like, we were doing data analysis like, before all these like, hearings happened like, back in November 2017. Uh, but like, right after the hearings, like, the House Intelligence Committee released like, for, uh, the first set of uh, the groups uh, and then their ads. Uh, and the meta information. So we matched our suspicious groups in meta information with that of um, the House Intelligence Committee. And then one out of a six hour suspicious group turned out to be uh, Internet Research Agency linked uh, Kremlin linked to groups. <coughs> um, and then uh, to count uh, how many ads are produced by each of these categories? Like we uh, blew out our search to entire five million ads, uh, and then uh, generate the frequencies. Uh, that way, we can do like an apple-to-apple comparison. Uh, FAC groups generated this many like ads. Uh, suspicious groups like generated this many ads, and things like that. Uh, I'm sure uh, I got a lot of questions about this, like from like you know, reporters. Um, sure, you are wondering about like who the suspicious groups are. Um, so again, like a suspicious groups by definition, um, uh, unidentifi unidentifiable, untrustable. So I don't know, but I can share uh, some of the traits, like a common patterns, like of the suspicious groups. Like for example, this group. <coughs> If you look at the about page, uh, very generic information, uh, mainly for those of us that believe Hillary Clinton belongs in prison, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but that's it. And then we did not uh, find any information other than this um, about this group. Um, same thing here. Uh, this is. Uh, the number one uh, destination for the most patriotic news events, information, or community represent like, millions of most patriotic Americans. Uh, so it's most patriotic site, but like, nobody knows uh, about this. And then it's just a sad like, you know, uh, website. Um, and then we did not find that a website that actually exists, existed. So, um, another example, um, this is like a, this was our suspicious group, like a later turned out to be a Russian group. Uh, our mission is to tell the bold truth about racism, join us, Black Lives Matter. So it just sound like, like a Black Lives Matter uh, message. Uh, but this got, like a, you know, we identified as suspicious because what's PM? Uh, and then we never recognized this like a landing page information. Set it aside, and later, uh, when we matched with the, uh, the landing page information provided by the House Intel Committee, it was like, one of the uh, Russian groups. Okay, um, so then it turned out uh, uh, the, all the 228 groups that like, we focused on, uh, more than half of the groups were suspicious groups. Uh, and again, like one out of six, our suspicious group turned out to be Russian group and then reclassified as a suspicious group, Russian. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, astroturf like a movement and unregistered groups. And then uh, by our definition, they are not suspicious. But as a person, I have a cut level suspicion that like, who they are. Like, they are pumping out a lot of ads. 
uh, where did they get this money, and then what they are doing, we don't know. But like they, because they generated a lot of uh, ads plus uh, some false news, uh, they got caught by like a, you know some fact checking organizations. So then we did not classify them as like a suspicious group. And then nonprofits uh, and then FEC groups, like the groups who did file a report to Federal Election Commission, uh, very, I guess, 3%, um, 3.5% uh, of the groups we examined. Um, so this is like a green light. Uh, and then no matter you know, how much you like FEC or not, like you know, back in, the people from US probably know that like, you know, the people don't necessarily like FEC. Uh, but that is our benchmark, like a you know comparison point. Um, then would see like ad volume. Uh, these are all like a non FEC groups. Um, the volume of like a non FEC groups, that including suspicious group, Russian astroturf, like a movement and registered group, and non profits who did not file a report to the FEC, altogether was four times larger than that of like a FEC ad FEC groups. Sorry, quick question. Just to clarify, are these all political campaigns? Yeah. What we are looking so at is political speaking, campaigns. So every one of these should have been registered with the FEC? Not necessarily. So that's like a little bit complicated issue uh, because, so for example, nonprofits like a 50C3, if they do public education only ads, um, conserve the nature uh, without mentioning candidate or you know, advocating uh, candidate, uh, then you know even if they ran a lot of ads uh, during the FEC window, that's fine. Uh, we excluded those like a public education ads, uh, but still there are some like gray areas. Like I didn't mention like a candidate names directly, so it might not be subject to uh, the law, subject uh, subject of law. But like they say like for example, move the embassy. Uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem right after a, a candidate mentioned about that issue. Uh, so that is, I think, like a delivery strategy because compared to TV advertising, digital advertising requires like a very you know uh, small window of production. So <clears throat> yeah, so it's uh, potentially all uh, illegal, but some of them are. Uh, uh, Okay, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in terms of ad content, actually, this uh, the content analysis was beyond the scope of uh, this study. Uh, but since we got asked, uh, got to ask a lot, so some of the things uh, that I can share is that this is like uh, some ads like clearly uh, tried to sell division. Um, and you know, veterans before illegals, uh, and then sometimes they contain like uh, misleading information. This is one of our suspicious group, uh, and then we found similar themes. Uh, actually, a lot of ads like this are uh, from Russian groups as well. So this is from like a Russian group. Uh, so interestingly, like a suspicious groups and then Russian groups share uh, common themes. The Russian groups, uh, the House Intelligence Committee actually like, released like a second time, like the full set of like a Facebook ads, like just the last week, uh, and then again, like uh, people seem to be puzzled. Like I, you know, got, I got a you know call from a reporter. I just don't understand whether you know there there are nonsense ads. Uh, sometimes um, it's you know, they produce like two different groups, the same like IRA, like Internet Research Agency operating groups, uh, but on the same issue, they put like a polar, polar opposite like as anti-immigration and pro-immigration. Um, so they, to me, it looks like they just to try to uh, target like extremes uh, and then promote these extreme ideas. Uh, so, some other questions uh, people asked a lot as like a Russian bass, like even before before the like second release of the House Intel Committee data, uh, Russian ads are really bad. Uh, my answer is not as it's not necessarily worse than other ads. Uh, so uh, these are non-Russian uh, 
non suspicious as uh, um, <clears throat> but these are actually like a non profits who did not file a report to FAC. Uh, these ads use the same kind of a tactic, uh, fear mongering mm -hmm. um, or uh, threat posing uh, tactics. So really interesting uh, set of ads, like some of the Russian ads, I could just um, say, um, give this necklace to uh, your girlfriend, uh, and that's it. Uh, we also found that some of our suspicious groups are named just a gift to shop, but um, the ads are you know, clearly anti-Hillary. Uh, um, but then if we uh, went to their page, um, it's just a collection of painting pictures. So it's, sometimes it's just hard to understand. Um, but I think it is really important to have like, a contextualized information. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm really curious. It feels like the right moment to ask this question. How did you differentiate between Russian groups and kind of non-Russian groups? So the Russian groups, I completely rely on the like, House Intelligence Committee data I see. because they release. They said this is the universe, uh, but they rely on Facebook data, it's like what Facebook said, right? Um, so. Parameters were internally at Facebook because I actually wondered about this when they passed the data to the, the government as well. I think okay, I that is an ex excellent question. I always wanted to ask Facebook about that, uh, but uh, I think it was like if the payment was made by IRA, mm -hmm. uh, I think that was probably uh, their parameter. Yeah. Okay, so that was about groups. Uh, and then second study was about targets of this divisive campaigns. Again, uh, go back to eScope, and then we said like, this is a user-based uh, uh, browser extension. <clears throat> so we extracted the ad and then meta information such as landing page information. Uh, but this is like an individual level, user level data. So like, each user got assigned like, a 36 digit uh, uh, identifiers that all anonymized, but they also filled out our surveys. Uh, and our baseline survey contained uh, the basic demographic information uh, and uh, political attitude and issue questions. Um, so by matching uh, the, the users who are exposed to like, a particular types of ads and then their survey responses, uh, we are able to quote unquote reverse engineer uh, the targeting uh, patterns. So that's what we did like for study two. And then study two takes like a, a bottom up, uh, sorry, top down approach. Like the study one uh, take like a, a bottom up approach. Uh, but here we started with like a five million uh, ads uh, and then we ran the same dictionary to identify eight domain uh, issues. Uh, issue domains, but then um, we realized that um, only 45% of right column ads contain the group sponsor name in the ad. So more than half of the ads did not have any information about the groups. Um, so that means we again had to, if we want to use the data, we again had to go back to all the landing pages, like one by one, and then we didn't want to do that, uh, so we just dropped the whole right column ad and then just to focus on the sponsored news feed. Um, and then we dropped the FEC uh, generated ad uh, because we wanted to know what, whether like, non FEC groups were able to target because it was like a big debate. Uh, you know, Russians don't have like, a sophisticated skills. It was all before Cambridge Analytica. Um, or you know, people still didn't believe that. Okay, even like you know, the researchers didn't believe that um, the targeting is only like a large resource-based groups could do targeting. But if you ever uh, done some advertising on Facebook, it's just really really easy. Um, so and and cheap <laughs> um, because they provide like a convenience tool uh, that shows that you are you you know this is a suggestion, uh, and then you are not reaching your audience and things like that. Um, 
So what we did, and then after we identified all these ads we want to look at, and then we combined with the survey data at the user level. And then for this study, we specifically focused on the state income uh, raise. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and then we developed uh, some targeting index. Uh, well, not developed, adopted like a you know targeting uh, index. Uh, this is actually a Siemens index uh, used by Experian, which is like a credit card company. Um, so this is widely used uh, by marketers. I used to work in a marketing research firm, uh, and the first day one, what you need to know is learn about how to use this data. Um, so this is, um, so for example, this is like a conditional probability, like a marginal probability formula. Um, if uh, I want to get a targeting index for Wisconsin uh, in regard to the gun issue, for example, there should be the probability of a gun issue at being exposed to anyone living in any state given that any ad uh, was exposed to people living in Wisconsin. Um, divided by the probability of the gun issue ad being exposed to anyone in any states in the country. Um, so it's just to try to take into account, like I say, like in California, there's so many people, and then obviously we'll, we'll see a lot of ads concentrated in California. So we don't want to, we want to take into account the actual population of the population differences across different states. So that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it is important to note that for that reason, this index uh, is calculated based on the, the voting age uh, population. So the actual denominator uh, we use like a census data. So it's sort of like a weighted, uh, taking into account the actual population size. Um, and then to be more conservative, we put the, uh, the one more criteria, um, which is reach meaning like a coverage of that area of the ads, like a concentration, uh, should be higher than average share when equal pro probability assumed. So if we say like all the ads are just randomly distributed, and then there are three income categories, then that's 33% to 33% for each category. So then uh, if I want to say low income are more targeted than national average, uh, then the coverage, like uh, people who received uh, the gun ads, uh, among the low income individuals uh, should be higher than 33%. So that's the, the criteria we added. Usually marketing researchers don't use this, uh, but uh, we wanted it to uh, be very conservative. Um, and then um, the targeting index is generally, it's the same thing like a 95% confidence level, although this is not like a statistical test. Uh, so <clears throat> when we say like a 100 is a national average, uh, so there's no clear targeting pattern. Uh, it's just about the same as national average. If it's 115 or uh, larger, then we say this is, they are more likely targeted, they are targeted uh, by 50% more than national average. Um, Okay, so what we found is with clear geographic uh, targeting patterns. Uh, so again, this is non-FEC groups, so groups uh, who did report uh, to FEC, generally like a large groups um, are excluded. Uh, and it indicates that uh, the states were targeted with the issue campaigns uh, across eight issue uh, you know, categories. And then Pennsylvania, uh, and Wisconsin, uh, Virginia, uh, those showed uh, highest scores uh, in terms of uh, the targeting index. Um, followed, uh, so Pennsylvania is number one, uh, and then followed by Virginia and Wisconsin. Um, and other states uh, traditionally considered like a better ground states, such as Ohio, Florida, uh, North Carolina, uh, also showed like a relatively high uh, level of the geographic targeting. Uh, but to contextualize this, uh, the Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, like the top two um, targeted uh, states, uh, in fact, uh, used to be like a strong democratic uh, hold, but uh, democratic stronghold, but like a ton to support uh, Trump with the razor thin margin. 
So for example, we found that like about 8% of all Pennsylvania residents uh, <clears throat> at least got uh, one issue, divisive issue ad. Uh, and their vote margin was 0.7%. Uh, 3% of all Wisconsin people got at least one issue ad uh, we looked at. Uh, vote margin for Wisconsin, Trump vote margin was like a 0.8%. Uh, so again, we are not claiming any causal inferences, but um, just to, to put it in the, uh, the context, um, that's the information. And then clearly, uh, even like a better ground states, like a, you know, states are targeted with the different issues. Um, <clears throat> so uh, North Carolina, uh, Wisconsin, for example, like heavily concentrated with the racial conflict issues. Uh, so taking Wisconsin as an example, uh, Wisconsin were targeted with the gun issue by 72% more than the national average, um, and, and then 83% more than uh, uh, with the racial issue uh, than the, compared to like, the national average. Um, another interesting pattern is that we found that uh, compared to the national average, the low-income voters, like their household income, lower than uh, $40,000, were specifically targeted with the ads on the immigration uh, and the racial conflict. Um, but um, middle-income voters uh, got a lot of uh, nationalism ads which contain uh, America first, America made, American jobs, and things like that. Um, and then uh, in terms of race, we also found that like, a white voters <coughs> compared to other racial ethnic groups were highly targeted with anti-immigration issue. Uh, so for example, uh, white voters received 44% uh, 40 per, more than the average uh, the voting age population. Um, and 87% uh, of the all immigration ads were concentrated among like, the white voters. So those are major findings. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so <laughs> I'll just quickly go through like why um, this happened. Um, first the thing is again, uh, unlike broadcast ads, digital ads are designed to appear to a particular individual voters, it is really hard to monitor. Uh, so they operate like a completely behind a scene, uh, and that makes like a public monitoring is incredibly difficult. Uh, also, you know, people never believe me. Like when I applied for a grant like three years ago, well, I never seen such an ads like, uh, because they are not in that category. They never seen like those ads. Um, so uh, that is one issue. Another is like a gaping loopholes. Uh, currently in the United States, there's no election law uh, that adequately addresses like a digital political advertising. Uh, none. Um, so there was uh, some guidelines, uh, FEC guidelines on the disclaimer paid for by information. But back in 2011, Google and Facebook lobbied so hard, and then they argue that like, you know, digital ads are so small, so it should be considered as a bumper sticker. Uh, so they, if we put like a paid for <coughs> buy, then it's gonna take up more than half of the ad size. That's not reasonable for marketers. Um, so somehow that argument to flow in. Uh, so uh, the disclaimer uh, requirement uh, were exempt. Uh, now, FEC is considering new disclaimer rules, and this is actually open comment period. So if you are interested in and care about the issue, please submit the comment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, more importantly, I think like a Citizens United, uh, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that, uh, well, putting some limit limits on, like a, uh, on contribution by different types of organization, uh, that is against the freedom of speech. Therefore, the Citizens United uh, made unlimited campaign contributions from any sources 
uh, any groups that open the door for election campaign uh, intervention by individuals or nonprofits, uh, PACs, corporations, uh, and as an oversight, uh, foreign groups. Um, so it is really incredibly difficult uh, to monitor the flow, like a foreign money flow, uh, into campaigns. Um, <clears throat> So, for example, like a nonprofits uh, are got all tax exempt, uh, and then they have a very few uh, disclosure requirement in terms of the spending. Uh, but they so they can generate, they can uh, uh, raise the funding, um, but then they don't have a requirement, disclosure requirement. Then they use the funding for candidates, uh, but there is no way we can monitor that. Um, so this is why, so we call them the, these groups like a dark money groups because we don't have any information about the donors of these nonprofits because that's nonprofits, nonprofits for public education. Um, <clears throat> so that is uh, a really big loophole at this point uh, that any groups that could claim uh, you know, public education uh, could come to like a you know, campaign scene. Uh, and then doing all uh, issue campaigns or even like a candidate attack campaigns, but uh, they have a very few requirements uh, for disclosure. So that's about it. I'll just leave it like for Q and A. <laughs>